Okay, beginning in verse 36 of Matthew 26. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. One of the first things I want to do is I want us to pay special attention to the opening words here. And I want you to see the trouble and distress and the deep anxiety way down to the depths of Jesus' soul that he was undergoing as he entered into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. So, to help facilitate this, I'm actually just going to put the opening words up on the screen here. And three things that I want to point out. First, the place. Because the place is symbolic. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Now, I'm sure most of us, or at least many of us, will have heard of the Garden of Gethsemane. But you may not know the meaning in Hebrew, Gethsemane means oil press. And uh, actually, this was a garden. There were olive trees. Uh, it's on the Mount of Olives. There's olive trees in this garden. But there was a press there. And I think that's symbolic. And you can think of an olive with its pit. In order to press the olive, there were these huge, like, millstones that uh, went around another stone. And olive, in order to extract the oil, would literally be squeezed and just crushed. And that's symbolic of what's happening to Jesus here. There's a way in which, uh, just spiritually, into the depths of his soul with great distress, he's, he's being crushed and even poured out. So that's the first thing that I wanted to point out, the, the place name. The second thing that I want to point out here is the description of what Jesus went through. It says he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, some of us, because Jesus is a hero, will have in mind something like John Wayne or Arnold Schwarzenegger, who when the enemy's coming at him, uh, doesn't flinch at all. Who, you know, steely-eyed, in a strong face, with all kinds of gumption, uh, and is not rattled in the least, but just, you know, girds themselves and prepares to fight. Um, that's television. <laughs> and this was real life. And I just, I want you to take in what happened with Jesus here. He began to be sorrowful and deeply troubled. If you read Luke's account of this, it talks about him sweating blood. You know, you've got to think about Jesus weeping and crying because that's what it looked like. Uh, this is not steely-eyed John Wayne, Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie. You know, this is real life. Jesus knows what's coming. 
and he is, he's sorrowful and he's troubled. Uh, the third thing I want to point out is Jesus' own description of what he was feeling. So he says to his dis disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So this is not just a tiny amount of fright, a tiny amount of trouble, a tiny amount of sorrow. Jesus is literally feeling so bad right now that, I mean, his spirit is, his soul is sunk so low that just from the emotion of it all, he thinks he could die. Just totally overwhelmed. Now that we've gotten this far, uh, I'd like to do something. Take just a kind of moment here. One of my, I guess, pet projects as a pastor, I am so distressed by how shallow sometimes modern Christianity is. And one of the things I endeavor is that every Christian knows what I just consider basic Christian doctrine. Not just that when you hear it, you can nod your head and agree, but somehow or another, uh, you have it for yourself. And these are things uh, I think, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of sermons, and you know, even though I preach every Sunday, I, I still am kind of in touch with what's happening in Christianity as a whole. I just feel distressed that basic Christian doctrine is sort of not ever taught. So. I'm going to do it. And some of you, when you hear me say, okay, we're going to teach Christian doctrine, are like, <sighs> so I get it. I'm going to try and make it as fun as possible. You're not even going to know you're learning if I do this right. Uh, here, basic Christian doctrine. Two things. First, the doctrine of God. And particularly when I say the doctrine of God, there is a particular doctrine, I believe, it's so essential to the message of the Bible, so essential to the message of the gospel, that if you don't know it and don't understand it, probably the basic message of the Bible will never make any sense at all, and it's the doctrine of the Trinity. And I would love it if every person here, when you heard the doctrine of the Trinity, you just knew these basic facts, that there's one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So maybe we should even say this out loud. One God, three persons. Ready? One God, three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I, I would just love it if every Christian, you know, knew that. One simple fact. I, I would love it even more if you got to know some scripture passages that point that out, and there are so many of them. I'm not going to get into that now, but if immediately scripture passages aren't coming to mind, some homework. Uh, find out what those scripture passages are so that you could teach this to someone else. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there's another doctrine. Again, I think this is so central to the message of the gospel, so central to the message of the Bible, called the doctrine of Christ. So doctrine of God, the Trinity, there's one God, three persons. The doctrine of Christ, there is one person with two natures. Jesus is both fully divine and fully human. So maybe we're going to say this out loud. We're going to say one person, two natures, fully divine, fully human. Ready? One person, two natures, fully divine, and fully human. Man, this is important stuff. And when I say it's important stuff, and this is, you know, part of my pet peeve as I start to talk about this, uh, did you know that Christianity did not start 20 years ago? And, there, you know, there was not some, like, hip, young, fresh, new teaching that just is sort of like, you know, taken over, no. Christianity now is thousands of years old, and Christians have been thinking deeply, even debating and arguing these points to come up with exactly the right way to explain what the Bible teaches. So what I want to do, I want to talk about one of the debates, and I really want to hone in on the doctrine of Christ, 
Because this passage where Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, became one of the key scripture passages that was at the center of this debate. So here comes the fun part. (laughs) An ancient Christian debate between St. Nicholas and Arius. St. Nicholas, that sounds familiar. I don't know if you know this. (laughs) St. Nicholas, who we now refer to as Santa Claus, was like a big contender for Orthodox Christianity. And there was this fellow Arius who was his opponent when it came to the doctrine of Christ. And, uh, you know, I even thought about, like, starting music. And now, weighing in at 325 pounds in one corner, Santa Claus, the one and only Saint Nick. And in the other corner, I don't know, I picture him as really small. So, weighing at 125 pounds, a short little man, Arius. All right. That was my attempt to make it fun. If that didn't work, it's not going to get better. Okay? <laughs> but listen, here, here was the issue, and I'll just put it here on the center screen. So there's the doctrine of Christ. There's one person with two natures, fully divine and fully human. Arius had this viewpoint that Jesus was not fully divine. Now, he agreed he was 100% human. This was Arius' thinking that Jesus was the Son of God. And what that meant was that at some point, and Arius pointed to his baptism, God looked down at humanity and said, ah, there's someone I can work with. And so at the time of his baptism, God, as it were, adopted Jesus as his son said, now this one, I'm going to give him special powers and special abilities so that he'll be able to do miracles and teach. But Arius said, listen, you shouldn't think of Jesus as God, as co-equal with the Father. Uh, That's not who he is. And anyway, in 325 AD, there was a council that gathered together of all church leaders who came to decide this whole thing. And at one point, apparently, reportedly, Arius stood up and started explaining that Jesus was not fully divine, that he was adopted by God the Father, and therefore was not co-equal and one of the persons in the Trinity. And anyway, as history tells it, St. Nicholas stood up, walked across the room, and there's some debate about this, either slapped him or punched him in the face. Jolly old St. Nicholas, <laughs> lean your ear this way. <laughs> Don't you tell a single soul what I'm going to say. Anyway, this Christmas, <laughs> this Christmas, when you're thinking about jolly old St. Nick, I want you to remember this sermon. <laughs> and I just want you to think about how St. Nicholas defended Orthodox Christianity against Arius and either slapped or punched Arius in the face, saying, no, Jesus is fully God, co-equal with the Father as to his divinity. Anyway, that was one fight. Uh, There was a second. Are you ready for it? With regard to the doctrine of Christ, there was another fellow. His name was Apollinarius. And uh, (laughs) round two, Apollinarius ended up uh, in a debate with a fellow by the name of Gregory of Nanziansis. Now, that's a mouthful, so if you're the kind of person who likes to take notes, I'm just going to slow down enough so that you can spell his name. Some of you ladies I know are in a First Peter Bible study. Gregory of Nanziansis is known as one of the Cappadocian fathers. And I know you just talked about Cappadocia last week. And he is one of the premier articulators 
or defenders of Christian orthodoxy. Anyway, Apollinarius, here's what he said. He said Jesus was fully God, but there's a way in which he's not fully human. I'll try to explain. This is what Apollinarius said. He said, okay, you can think about human beings. Human beings have both a body and a soul, right? If you don't have a body and a soul, you are not a human being. And Apollinarius was trying to figure out how was it that the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh. He says, ah, this is how. What God did is he took out the human soul and he put inside in its place his divinity. So that you did not have a full human being, body and soul. You had like a half human being, sort of human flesh inhabited by the divine spirit or the divine soul of the second person of the Trinity. Anyway, this Gregor of Nancianza says, no, you cannot think this way. And this is his famous line. I mean, it's so famous that Christians throughout history, they just, they knew it. I, I know that maybe today we don't know it because we've lost touch with Christian history, but this was such a famous line. He said, whatever is not assumed is not healed. This is what he meant by it. He said, look, if all God did was assume our flesh, then our flesh is healed, but not our soul. He said, in order for Jesus to be redeemer, he had to be fully human. He had to be fully human both in body and soul. Does that make sense? So Jesus had not only a, a fully human body, but also a fully human soul. And here, verse 20, well, where are we here? Verse 38, when Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus had a fully human soul. Now, I took the time today to go through these doctrines, right? Trinity, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ, one person with two natures, fully divine, fully human. I believe every Christian needs to have these facts like right there in their hand because they stand at the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is that Jesus was a perfect substitute. He had to be fully human because human beings have sinned. Justice requires that, you know, he who does the crime does the time. And so in order to serve as a substitute, he had to be fully human in every single way. But he also had to be fully God. You know, just a mere human being, if that human being was sinless, might be able to pay the sin for one person. But because Jesus was divine, 100% God. He had this eternal capacity, not only to bear the weight of my sins, but also the weight of your sins and the sins of the whole world. He had to be God in order to bear the full weight of our sins. Anyway, one more reason this is important. Whatever is not assumed is not healed. A lot of our troubles in this life are physical, right? We get sick. Our bodies break down. But I would submit to you that more of our problems are in our soul. So we face troubles of soul like this, grief, worry, anxieties, fears and phobias, addictions depression and sadness, loneliness. Wouldn't you agree to me? In a way, those are the real problems, the down deep problems. Now listen, we have body problems too. We get things that go wrong, they start to hurt. It, I mean, if some of us here are here today facing sickness or illness or injury, uh, I want you to know that Jesus, you know, he took on our human flesh to come and heal our flesh. But today, 
especially as we read these words, Jesus is saying that his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I want you to realize that the second person of the Trinity took on our full humanity and he suffered in his soul, which tells us he came to fix our real problems. And if you're lonely, if you're depressed, if today you came filled with grief, if you've got anxiety, or whatever it is, whatever's troubling you inside, down deep, I just want you to hear Jesus came to heal and fix that too. Okay? Now, all right. The doctrine part of the sermon's over. Now I want to talk about prayer. <laughs> that was sort of fun, wasn't it? I mean, it was still, it was still palatable. And this Christmas, you're going to be like, take that, Arius, right? <laughs> Jesus is God. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about prayer. There's something that this prayer shows us that I think is so important. Maybe I'll come at it this way. How many of you ever prayed for something only to find out that the answer to the prayer was no? Okay. I think pretty much anyone here who has prayed before has gotten the answer no. And here's an example of a prayer that Jesus prayed where the answer to his prayer is obviously no. So in verse 39, when Jesus first prays, this is his prayer. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus entering into the garden, distressed and overwhelmed, full of sorrow even to the point of death. Uh, I picture him, you know, having fallen with his face to the ground, the Bible says, just crying out in a sincere, honest, passionate prayer, like, God, is there any other way than what's about to happen? If so, you know, let's do it that way. That's his prayer. Is there any other way? And he concludes by saying, look, I'm not going to go rogue here. I ultimately trust you, Father. I know whatever your answer is, that it's for the best. And so not what I will, but what you will. And that's his prayer. Anyway, he goes after this prayer to visit his disciples. He had told them to stay awake. If you look at verse 40, it says he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he asked them, couldn't you men keep watch with me for even one hour? And it's almost as though in his words you can hear the distress and the sorrow and the loneliness and the grief and the despair like deepen. And I'm not exactly sure what all might have been going on there, but one thing is really clear. The fact that Jesus found his disciples sleeping gave him the answer to his prayer. No, it's not possible. There is no other way. So if you look at verse 42, it says he, he went away and a second time prayed this, and I'll put it here on the screen. My father, if it's, see the difference here? Not possible. He'd gotten the answer. Since it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Like, okay. Uh, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. But I'm I'm ready to follow you. And boy, there's something going on here. And I want to dig down so we all see it. So here it is, Jesus, he prayed, he got the answer, no. And by the way, as far as I can tell, there's, there's three different possible answers. God may say yes, he may say no, or he may say be patient, not yet. Uh, I think probably everyone here has gotten those three answers at one time or another. Here, Jesus got the answer, no. There is no other way. And here's what I want you to see. Some of us, if God says no too often, we may say, ah, you know, what's the point of prayer? This is pointless. Why do I waste my breath? Why do I waste my time? 
Uh, this passage shows us that even though God the Father said no, prayer was still effective. How do we know it's effective? Well, we have to look at Jesus' state of mind when he enters the garden and when he leaves the garden. So what's his state of mind when he enters the garden? We just went through it. He's sorrowful, he's troubled, he's in deep despair, he's overwhelmed to the point of death in the depths of his soul. He's falling with his face to the ground, he's crying out, he's sweating drops of blood, he's frightened, he's afraid. Those are all the things that are there when he enters the garden. And here, let's even dig down a little deeper, why? Well, right before Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples. And I want you, are you still with me in your Bibles? Matthew chapter 26. I want you to see this. If you look up to verse 31, as he's celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples, he tells them something. In verse 31, he tells them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, and he quotes from Zechariah chapter 13. He says, I'll strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Let's hold that thought for a moment. Would you do something? Keep a finger there. Turn with me also to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 also contains the account of Jesus' prayer on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want you to look with me starting at verse 34. So his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane starts at verse 39. But I want to look just before that. While Jesus is celebrating the last supper with his disciples, he, he does something. He, he speaks to his disciples. And in particular, in verse 34, he's speaking to Peter. And he says to Peter, are you there with me? I tell you, Peter... Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. So, right, he had told the disciples, you're all going to scatter. Now he tells Peter, look, before this night's over, you're going to deny me three times. And then, if you look down at verse 37, he substantiates that. He says, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, which, by the way, is from Isaiah 53. Then he says, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching fulfillment. And uh, you can go back to Matthew 26. Here's what I find interesting. This gives us some insight. Why is Jesus sorrowful and troubled? Why is his soul overwhelmed? It's because he's been reading and contemplating the Bible. And he's become convinced that there are passages, particularly in the Old Testament, that describe what's about to happen to him. So in Matthew chapter 26, he's quoting from Zechariah 13, and it's helpful to see the whole context. Zechariah 13, verses 6 and 7, Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. So Jesus is telling his disciples, you're all going to be scattered. The Bible says so. But what's he thinking about? He's thinking about the sword of God Almighty. Now, we're all sinners. We've broken God's law. God's just. He will punish sin. The sword is supposed to come down on us. But what does Jesus see the sword coming down and doing? Instead of striking the flock, striking who? The shepherd. Now look at Isaiah 53. He was numbered with transgressors. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We considered him, look at this phrase, punished by who? God. Stricken by him. Afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was, here's this word, Garden of Gethsemane, crushed for our iniquities. Jesus is reading the Old Testament. He's saying, this is what's about to happen to me. God's sword of all his vengeance and wrath is about to strike me. I'm about to be punished 
for every sin that ever has or will be committed by humanity. And now you just take for a moment a survey of the sins that humanity has you know, undertook throughout the history of the world, and Jesus is literally thinking about how God is going to strike him. And uh, I just submit to you that that's why when he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, he's just like, it's overwhelming. He's about to be punished for every sin that ever has or will be committed. God's mighty arm's about to come down on him. The sword of his wrath is about to strike him. He's about to be crushed for every sin we ever have or will commit. And he's overwhelmed. He can't take it. He's sweating drops of blood. He falls to the ground and cries out, God, if there's any other way, if there's any other way. And the father says, no. Okay, that's him entering the garden. Now look at this passage. How does he leave the garden. Well, in verse 43, he goes back, he prays a third time. And then in verse 45, he returns to his disciples. He finds them sleeping. He says, are you still sleeping and resting? He says, look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinner. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. And Judas is coming into the garden along with all the Ro Roman soldiers. Now, let me help you see the scene in your mind. He doesn't frantically go over and wake his disciples like, come on, guys, let's get out of here. They're coming. That's not what he does. He comes over and he says, guys, wake up. It's time. Here comes my betrayers. And now, look at this. He's not running away. He's saying, let's go. And he's ready with obedience. Not to run away, but to walk towards his arrest the way he was mistreated and mocked, ultimately to the place of the cross where, in fact, God would raise his sword and strike him down. As he enters the garden, he's ridden with anxiety, fear, trouble, worry, concern. As he leaves, he's confident and ready to go. What, what made the difference? There's only one thing prayer. He was strengthened by God through prayer. To me, that's awesome. Even when God says no, prayer is effective. Even when the answer isn't what we want, when we commune with God, when we assume who he is, when we understand his plan, we're strengthened, we're encouraged, we're made ready for whatever it is God's will is, God, whatever your will is, may your will be done.